You know, names are important, aren't they? Uh, all of us have one. Uh, in fact, most of us have three names, a first name, a middle name, and a last name. And uh, maybe you have a name that you were given and you go by a shortened version of it. Or maybe you have a nickname that's caught on. Uh, we're all in different places. I, I don't know if you guys know this. I don't know if I've ever shared it with you. But when I was born, my cousin couldn't say Vernon. And so she, it came out Vernon. And so that morphed into Bernie. And for years, in my young years, uh, my family called me Bernie. My mom still does on occasion. And uh, so you never know. If that, wouldn't have, if that would have stuck, you might have a Pastor Bernie right now. And I kind of think that has a ring to it. So I, I do personally. Um, yeah, w- when I was a teenager, this guy started showing up everywhere. And uh, I worked at Earl's Super Value in Franklin, Ohio as a stock boy and a grocery carryout boy. And everybody got to know me. And if I have not heard that phrase once, I've heard it a million times. People would say it. Oh, and they would say it like it was the first time anybody had ever said it, you know. You know how that goes, huh? And, and that's when Vernon became Vern. Mid-80s, late-80s, and I've been Vern ever since. Uh, but names are important, aren't they? In fact, uh, we identify by a name. Uh, they say that your favorite word, whether you like to admit it or not, is your name. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but it does sound kind of close. In ancient Jewish culture, uh, names had meanings. Uh, in other words, you didn't just get your favorite name from your parents. Often the name surrounded something about your birth or the times or a situation. A good example of that is Jacob's wife, Rachel, in the Bible, the Old Testament. She gave birth to her last son, Benjamin, and then she died. And before she died, she gave her son the name Benjamin, which means son of my days. You can see that fit. Names were more than just a moniker, what you'd be called. They, they had meaning. Uh, the name Jesus. We say Jesus in English, but in the original uh, language of his day, it wasn't Jesus. It was Yeshua. Uh, Yeshua. And, and Yeshua means God saves. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I mean, there it is, right out in front. Everybody, when they said his name, they're declaring his mission. It's pretty interesting. And that's not just a neat little thing. It happens throughout all of Scripture. We're going to see some of that today. Very fitting, Jesus, Yeshua. Uh, there are dozens of names, dozens of titles in the Old Testament for God. We're going to look at three today, but here's a few of them. I'll show a list. We have El, El Elohi, El Elyon, Elohim, El Shaddai. Some of these you might have heard before. Adonai, Yahweh, Yahweh Nisi, Yahweh Rapha, uh, Yahweh Shema. Some of you are more familiar with Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha. We'll get into a little bit of why I made the change today. But we call, in the Old Testament, God is called by lots of different names. and We have different names for God, don't we? We call him God, we call him Lord, we call him Father. Um, Why so many? Well, when you look at God and his infinite power, his infinite wisdom, and and all that he is and and has, uh, very quickly we realize that there has to be all these different names because he is such an incredible God. I mean, we want to describe him in lots of ways. And so the Old Testament gives us insight into who he is by giving us all of these names. God wants us to know him. Remember, he created us for relationship. He wants relationship with each and every one of us. That sounds a bit far out and kind of crazy, but yes, the God of all creation knows you and wants relationship with you individually. And so I thought it would be worth our while to take some time and dive into some of these Old Testament names. I'm going to use lots of resources to do it. Resources from Craig Groeschel, a great pastor out of Kansas City, another pastor, some little pastor some of you might have heard of by the name of Tony Evans. Tony Evans! I like Tony Evans. Uh, an online tool we'll be using, by The Bible Project. Also a book by David Wilkerson, who passed away in 2011, called Knowing God by Name probably pull from some other places too, but we've entitled this series, The Names of God. The Names of God. And this is important because the Bible says in Psalm chapter 9, those who know your name, it's talking about God, those who know your name, trust in you. The better you know God, 
the better you know who he is, what he stands for, and all of these names that he's ascribed in the Old Testament, the more you will want to trust him and you'll see he's worth trusting in. So today we're going to look at the three top, we won't always look at multiple names each week, but today we're going to look very quickly at three of the top names used for God in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, so we're going to do a lot of Hebrew words today. Please don't let that close you down. It, 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 I've done, I'm a pretty simple-minded guy, so you'll be able to track with this super easy. But Hebrews is, a, is, is what all of these names are originally. And, and starting, we're going to start with the third most used name in the Old Testament, and that is Adonai. You want to say it with me? Adonai. See, two versions. In the old way of spelling, it was with a Y, not with an I. But everywhere in the Old Testament, you see the word Lord, capital L, lowercase O-R-D. In the original language, it was Adonai. And it means master. It means owner. Used over 400 times in the Old Testament. Not always of God. Yeah, there were lots of different Adonais. In fact, uh, if you were a landowner or a master of lots of servants, you might be called Adonai. Uh, Sarah called Abraham Adonai. I've tried to pass that on to my wife, but she won't pick up on it. She doesn't like the idea. Uh, she goes, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but the Bible says that God is Adonai. But he's not just a Adonai. He is Adonai of Adonais. He is the Lord of of lords. Uh, Sarah, by the way, did that because she, she wanted everybody to know that she belonged to, to her husband. And that's why we call him Lord. We belong to him. He's our Lord. Psalm 50, verse 10 through 12, captures how God is master, how he's owner of all. Look at this passage here with me. It says, every animal of the forest is mine. This is from God. He goes on, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. I'm kind of glad they're his. I don't want them. Uh, if, you, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Uh, that kind of grabs the idea of how God is Adonai. He's owner of everything. He is master and owner of it all. He is Adonai. Now, with this realization... Should that affect the way we live our lives? I think about it because a lot of times I think about me owning my house or my car. I think about my family is my family. But really none of it is. None of it's really mine. It's only mine for a short time. And I will, I've been given it as a gift from God. And he wants me to steward or manage it well in a way that honors him. And there'll come a day that I will release it all. And it will no longer be mine. And, and in the end, everything belongs to him, just like it says there in the Psalms. He owns it all. We just get it for a little while, and we need to honor him. So Adonai, he's the Adonai of Adonai, he's the Lord of Lords. And that is the third most common referenced name for God, title for God. The second most commonly used reference for God in the Bible, the Old Testament, is Elohim. Let's say that together. Ready? Elohim. And Elohim is everywhere in the Old Testament you see the word God. It's the word Elohim in the original language. Uh, it, it, it means mighty one. Uh, heavenly beings are always often referred to as Elohim. Uh, it's a plural word meaning more than just one, but God is Elohim, uh, used over 2,600 times in the Old Testament. Genesis 1-1 is the first place we see it. In the beginning, God, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. A lot of people will point to the Elohim being used here, and it's a plural form, as the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit created the heavens and the earth. Keep going in the chapter, it even says, let us create man in our own image. It's the Godhead, the three who are one. Kind of a mystery how all of that works. That's a topic for another day. Like Adonai, the title Elohim is also used for things other than God. Like heavenly beings are referred to sometimes as Adonai. Uh, here's an example in Psalm 82. This, would be, this is a surprising verse for a lot of people. Elohim, God, resides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the Elohims. That's the word in the original language. Yeah, two different places. Uh, so God is Elohim. There are other Elohims, other heavenly beings, but he is the Elohim of Elohims. 
He is the creator of all of the other heavenly beings, the other heavenly mighty beings, uh, whether they're archangels or, or whatever. So actually there are various Elohims, mighty heavenly beings, but there is only one true living God over all, and that is the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Bible. He's creator of all. And we see this in Scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 10. God is God of gods. It says, Elohim is Elohim of Elohims. Uh, he is God of gods. Now, you say, wait a minute, Vern. I thought, there were, I thought there were, we were theists. We only believed in one God, theism. We, we don't believe in other gods. Well, the Bible references other heavenly beings like angels, archangels as Elohim. So that's why it's translated gods, if that helps at all. Just because it's translated doesn't mean it's a perfect word for English. It might have been at the time, but remember, they're coming from Hebrew into English, and sometimes there's a breakdown. Uh, we try our best, but there's a breakdown. So he's the God of all heavenly beings, uh, angels and the like. This is the second most commonly referenced name for, for God in the Old Testament. But what's the number one name? Don't go to the next slide yet. What's the number one? Anybody want to take a guess what the number one name for God in the Bible is, the Old Testament Bible? Anybody want to take a guess? Oh, interesting, interesting. You're right there. You're right there. And I could, you could say, yes, she's got it, Yahweh. You know, and, and you're really right there with Jehovah too, and you'll see that in just a little bit. Good job. You get a star for today. You do, you do. Uh, so yes, the number one name is God's personal name, Yahweh. And every time in the Old Testament you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, in the original language, it's Yahweh. Let's say Yahweh together. Yahweh. Yeah, it means who is and will be. And it's used uh, thousands of times in the Old Testament. I have the number. I'll get to it in here in just a minute. Number one, and it's the personal name of God. For thousands of years, Jewish people, every morning and every night, they still do this, those who are faithful religious folks, they pray what's called the Shema. And the word Shema in Hebrew means listen or hear, hear. And they pray this every morning and every night. We'll put it on the screens here. This is part of their prayer. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 5. I thought it would be fun for all of us to join our Jewish, uh, our, our, the Jewish people, and let's pray this right now. Okay, we'll say it out loud together. Here we go. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And it's right out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Every morning, every night, they pray this along with other scriptures as a prayer to the Lord. And, and, and in this passage, we see all three of the names for God that we've already covered. First, we see Adonai, translated with capital L, lowercase o-r-d. That's in yellow. Then we see Elohim. That's the God in blue. And then we see another word, L-O-R-D, all caps. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Some of you have. Maybe some of you haven't. When you read the Bible, there's a difference between the two words, Lord, all caps, and Lord with lowercase o-r-d. That all capped Lord, that is the name of God. That is Yahweh in the original language. God first shared his name when he appeared to Moses at the burning bush. Remember, God commissions Moses to go back to Egypt to free him. Let my people go. And so he's taking all this message in, and, and he gets ready to leave. And he, before he leaves, he says, but, but, but Lord, who shall I say sent me? If they ask, what, what is the name of the God who sends you? What am I to say? And in Genesis 3, verse 14, it says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, that's a little bit confusing. What's the name? What is your name that I tell these people who sent me if they ask? I am that I am. You know? And in the original language... First, let me back up. That's a reference to who we know as the great I am. How many have heard of the great I am as a reference to God? Yeah, another. The great I am. It comes from this passage. I am that I am. The great I am. And, and in the original Hebrew, this is what he said. He said, I am eh yeah. Eh yeah. God says, tell them eh yeah sent you. And eh yeah means who is and will be. But that doesn't make a lot of sense either, does it? Moses, go tell them that 
that uh, he is and will be sent me. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And so in the next verse, verse 15, God changes a little bit. He says, instead of saying, eh, yet sent you, God says, say to the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of our ancestors has sent me to you. And the name Yahweh is made up of four Hebrew letters, yod heh vah he, and you read it from right to left, not left to right. All of Hebrew is read backwards. The back of the book is their first page. They start back here, and it's read this way. Yeah, exactly the opposite of the way we read it. But the four letters, yod heh vav heh, and this is the most used name for God in the Old Testament. And as far as we know, because Hebrew also doesn't have vowels. As far as we know, it's pronounced Yahweh. The reason I say as far as we know is because classic Hebrew with a term like this that is not used very much, we're not 100% sure it is Yahweh, but it's very close if it's not. And, it's, and they feel very confident, fairly confident that's what it is. Again, this is the personal name of God. Your name, Chris, you know, Kate, uh, Patty, your name, that's your name. My name's, Ver- his name's Yahweh, Yahweh. It's used 6,000, over 6,500 times in the Old Testament. Twice as many as Elohim, heavenly mighty being. And even though it's used so many times in the Old Testament, the most referenced name for God, many Christians don't even know the name. Many have never even, there might be some watching or right here today, and you're like, God has a name? I thought it was God. It's not God. That's a title. He has a name, and it's Yahweh. And you're thinking to yourself, how could I not know this? There's a reason you don't know this. Because traditionally, the name is not said. Now, let me follow up on this. Most Bible translations you read through, Nowhere have Yahweh written in it. In fact, I don't know of a Bible translation in English that has Yahweh. I could be wrong on that, but I don't know of one. All of the main ones, they use capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, everywhere Yahweh is found. Why? Why do they not put the name of God? Well, for Israelites, the name is so sacred, they don't utter it. In in fact, they don't want to risk using the name in vain, one of the big Ten Commandments. And so they just don't say it at all. And so when they're reading Scripture, and every time they come to yod heh vav heh the name of God, Yahweh, everywhere it's found, they say Adonai, which was the other word we looked at, Adonai, Um, which is a... What they've done here is somewhere along the line, the scribes began to... Help. They wanted to have a visual reminder so that none of the Jewish people would ever say Yahweh when they're reading the scriptures. And so what they did was they took the word, the, the letters, yod heh vah heh, and they took the name Adonai and they put the vowels in between the consonants of yod heh vah heh. Now, some of you are saying, wait a minute, Vern, yod heh vah heh is backwards, like you said, and Adonai was forwards, so you got that wrong, and I did, but it's the same letters. I didn't want to confuse it by doing the whole thing backwards. So, but it's the same vowels. And so they put those vowels from one word into, in between yod heh vav heh, and it made a new word, a, a hybrid word, Yehoah. Yehoah. Now, they didn't say Yehoah when they would read through their ancient texts and they would come to yod heh They wouldn't say Yehoah. They would say Adonai. They would not say Yahweh. They would say Adonai. Now, when the Christian scribes came along years later, and they're reading all these ancient texts from the Hebrews, they saw Yehoah, and they translated it. A modern-day derivative is... Jehovah. Jehovah. So Jehovah is not a biblical word. It's a hybrid word. It's taking Yahweh and inserting the vowels from another word, Adonai, and making a new word. Now, Jews never said Yehovah. It was just a reminder word so that when they read and came to it, they would say Adonai and not say the name of God. But the, the Christian scribes didn't know that. And so they started translating the Bible and putting Yehovah in there. Only modern derivatives, Jehovah in there. 
but it's a hybrid word. It's not even a real name for God. It's a visual reminder. Now, once they realized their error, they fixed it. And that's why in most all, not all, but most all translations today, when you get to the word where Je- Yahweh is, it doesn't say Jehovah, it says Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Why did they do that? Because they want to honor the Jewish tradition. It's offensive to them to say that name, so they carried that tradition on and put Lord. And that's why so many Christians today don't know the name of God, Yahweh. They don't use it because it's kind of been taken out, in a sense, from the text, out of respect for the Jews who call it a sacred name. So uh, Jewish rabbis to this day will teach that the name Yahweh is declared even in the life breath of man. And I'll do this for just three times to see if you can hear it. Can you hear Yahweh and what I'm going to do? Listen closely. I'm not even trying. And you can, you, when you're listening for it, you can hear it. They say that every time we breathe, we're declaring the personal name of God. He is in the life breath of man. Yahweh, the personal name of God, revealed by him to Moses at the burning bush. And you know what it's saying? What all of this screams to us? God wants relationship with us. It's personal to him. He shares his personal name with us. This is personal, what he wants. A lot of people, you know, they believe in Elohim, the great mighty heavenly being. But he wants us to know him personally as Yahweh, the self-revealing personal creator God of all. And the big question we need to have today is, do you know him? Not know of him, not believe in him. Do you know him? We all believe there's a president of the United States. There have been many. We know they exist, but do you know the president? If you were to see him out and about, would he go, hey, and give your name and you say it back to him? No, I don't think any of us do. God wants us to know him personally. He knows us by name. He has the hairs on our head numbered. And he wants us to know him by name. This is what this, this delineates Christianity and Judaism from all the other faiths of the world. Their God isn't personal. But this God is. The God of the Bible is very personal. And he wants us to know him. Which brings up a good question. How do we know Yahweh? How do we know Yahweh? If you would, grab your Bibles. And uh, that, that was all introduction, by the way. I'm just kidding. Uh, Grab your Bibles. Look with me. Exodus chapter 33. You have Genesis, the first book, and then Exodus. Exodus 33. And uh, let's look here. Um, This is after the Israelites have been freed from Egypt. They're encamped at Mount Sinai. And uh, so uh, Moses knows God. He's been led by God. And uh, and let's look here. Uh, We do offer Bibles always when you come in. Feel free to grab one. Just put them back when you're done. So look here at the last sentence of verse 12, Exodus 33, last sentence of verse 12, Moses is praying to God and he says, you have said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. Verse 13, if you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. Look at verse 17. And the Lord, that would be Yahweh, and Yahweh said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. See the personalness of all this? It's all over the Old Testament text. It's why God references himself as the husband of Israel. And they are his wife. It's why when they go off and worship false gods, he says, you've not just committed idolatry, you've committed idolatry. They've been unfaithful to him. At one point, he says, I divorce you. 
personal relationship. That's what he wants with us. He's a personal God who gives us personal name. Verse 17, and Yahweh said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Verse 19, and Yahweh said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, Yahweh, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one can see me and live live. Verse 21, then Yahweh said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock where my glory passes by. I will put you in a cleft uh, uh, in the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. But Vern, I thought Moses, I thought he already knew God's name from the burning bush scene. Now, see, that was just an introduction. That was his introduction to Yahweh. Here Moses is getting to know. They're going into deeper relationship. They're getting up close and personal. And Moses says, I want to know you. I want you to show yourself to me. Which brings up a really good point. It's easy for us to believe in God as Elohim, the mighty heavenly being. The question is, do you want to know him up close and personal? Where he's not just Elohim, he's Yahweh. Because he desires the personal relationship. See, it's easy for us not to know him as Yahweh. He's Elohim, the great big heavenly being in the sky. Because we're distracted. We get distracted by the stuff of this world, by our busy lives. We get focused on other things, important things even. And before long, we don't get to know God. We know Elohim, but we don't know him as Yahweh personally. Moses says, I want to know you. I want to be close and personal with you. And some of us, for years ago, we believed We put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and we knew of Elohim, the great heavenly being God, not Moses. He's not satisfied with just that. That's not enough for him. For us, maybe we were satisfied, but not Moses. Moses is like, I want to know Yahweh. I want to be up close and personal, personal level. I wonder, are you satisfied for just an introduction Are you satisfied for a religious association with the heavenly being? I'm saved. I'm good. I know Jesus. I'm on my way to heaven. Or do you want to really know the living God? Where he directs and alters the way you live your life because you're so close and personal with him. See, Moses started out all alone. And he begins to pray and seek after Yahweh beyond the introduction of the bush. And and God said to him, I have found favor with you. Moses was living life now to know God, to be close to him, to please him. And and he prioritized knowing God. He, He turned off the TV, you could say. He logged out so he wasn't on Facebook too much. He, 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 he got alone with God so he could get to know him. He prioritized God. I remember the first time I met my wife, as you guys remember, probably the first time you met your spouse, if you have one. And, and I, uh, I was 35, got married late in life. I, I don't know if I've ever told you this. I, I was beginning to accept the reality that I might not ever be married. And uh, I remember being on my bed one day, and I was praying on my hands and knees. And I said, Lord, if, if you uh, don't want me married, that's okay. I'm okay with that. All I ask is that you you use me mightily in ministry. And I guess the Lord went, poor thing. I'm never going to be able to use him mightily in ministry. I guess I better bring a wife to him. Because within a few months, I met my wife. (laughs) Uh, I hope not. Anyway, but I I met Melissa first time. It was a setup with some friends. And uh, there was about six or seven of us. We went out to dinner. She was there. I was there. And I got to know. And the first thing I remember among the first things I thought is, oh, my goodness, she is so pretty. Could somebody that pretty be interested in me? That's what I thought to myself. And so uh, we got to know each other a little bit during that meeting and introduction anyway. 
And then later on, I talked to the person who set the whole thing up, and I said, do you think she'd be okay? Talk to her, see if she's okay if I call her. I didn't want to just, you know, presume. And so she says, yeah, you can call her. She said she would like you to call her. So we, we talked to each other. We then had our own solo date, went to, went to Olive Garden and had our solo day. And I had all kinds of questions. I wanted to know what her hopes and dreams were and what, what was going on here. I wanted to get to know her. I want to know who she is. She want to know who I was. And, 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 and as, as the weeks turned into months, I was working extra hard so I could be done in the evening so I could go spend time with her. I used to work every Saturday leading up to Sunday. That was sermon prep day. <laughs> I was insane is what I was. And I would work every Saturday on my sermon. And, and, and I'd stop that. As soon as I started dating Melissa, I wanted to be done on Friday so I could spend Saturday with Melissa. We get close, get personal, get to know each other more. I wanted to spend time with her. She was my priority. I wanted to know her. I share that because a lot of times people say they want to know God. But the question is, is he your priority? Is he a priority in your life? Well, yeah, of course he is. Is it a priority to get alone with him in his word and dive studying who he is and what he desires of you from his word? To learn from other people, whether it be Sunday school classes or other good Bible teachers from books or podcasts or on YouTube or wherever. Are you satisfied with turning off the TV so that you can spend time and learn and grow with others in this relationship with God? See, we prioritize a lot of things, don't we? We prioritize vacation. We prioritize making sure we're at work. We prioritize getting the gutters cleaned out every fall and then maybe in the spring. We prioritize all kinds of things. Facebook, TV, multiple hours, sometimes multiple days out of the week. And, and before long, we ask somebody, hey, you know, what's your relationship with God like? And they go, well, you know, I, I just don't have the time. And we can say that all day long. We can say that a lot. But the reality is it's just not a priority. I just don't have the time. You know, there's a he we've been looking at Hebrew words. There's a Hebrew word for that too. You guys can say it with me. Ready? Ba, lo, ni. Baloney. I don't have the time. Baloney. Baloney. It's amazing how... I had somebody tell me this once. I hated it. It went right through me. I hated it. But you know what? I've gone back to it again and again because the person, what they said was right. You know what? We have the time for what we want. If you love Hawaii Five-0, I don't even know if it's on TV anymore. If you have, love Survivor, you know what? When it comes on, you watch every episode. If you love going on bike rides, guess what? When it gets warm, you're on bike rides. Not all the time, but you make time. You love your family, you're going to spend time with your family. We do what we want to do, and the same is true with God. If he's a priority, we'll make him a priority. Moses says, I want to know you. I, I, I'm Lord, and he sought God. He prayed and prayed. He sought God. He prayed again and again. Yahweh, I want relationship with you. You said you find favor in me. And he did. See, when we go to God, we don't go on our terms. He's the living God of all creation. He spoke. It was so, and it was good. We go to God. It's on his terms because he's the living God. He doesn't need us. We need him. So we go to him on his terms. He's God. He's holy. That's why he says, love me with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 17 says, I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. I'm going to say that again. That is not in your notes. Proverbs 8, 17. I love those who love me, God says, and those who seek me find me. I've been so pleasantly surprised multiple times in my life when I needed God. I needed him to work. I needed him to move. And I sought him with everything in me, crying out to him, going in the middle of cornfields and crying before the sun comes up because I needed God. God, I need you. I want you to come. God, please answer me. Work, move, direct. And I sought him again and again, and I would watch, as I meant it with all my heart, I would watch God, not physically, but he would step in and begin to work and move. You know why? Because Proverbs 8, 17 is God's word. I love those who love me. Those who seek me find me. 
The problem isn't that God isn't working in our lives. Oftentimes the problem is we're not seeking him enough to see him working in our lives. And when he's a priority and we want to be up close and personal and we want to know God, he sees that. He finds favor. I love those who love me. And those who seek me find me. He told Moses, you are pleasing in my sight. So go up to the mountain and I'll come and visit you. But you can't see all of me because you can't handle all of me. And that's so true. You can't see the face of God. We would die instantly. In all of his glory would consume us. But he says, I'll let you see enough to realize that there's so much more of me. And Moses went up on that mountain, and God shielded him in the cleft of the rock. I don't know how it worked exactly, but it said God put his hand over Moses' face so that he couldn't see. And then God passed by, declaring his name, Yahweh. And then he removed the hand so that Moses could see his back. And Moses saw the back of God. I don't know how it works. He's spirit. He's not, maybe there's a manifestation of it. Maybe it was the person of Jesus that he saw. I don't know. But the point was, Moses was changed forever. And he was enlightened and he saw everything differently. And he began to be illuminated, his mind and his thinking. And he began to be revealed to him how God began everything all the way back in creation. Remember the first five books of the Old Testament? The Pentateuch is what we call them, or the Torah. The Torah, that's written by Moses. Moses, yeah, all these years later. He was writing it because he was revealed in this personal relationship with God, the truth of creation, how God spoke the heavens and the earth, and they were formless and void, and, and in the Spirit hovered all over the face of the deep, and God said, and it was so, and it was good, and he wrote all this down. God's revealing. See, this wasn't Moses doing this. This was God revealing up close a personal relationship with Yahweh began to illuminate him to the truths of the universe. There was interaction. God revealed himself to him. And here's the thing. Yahweh wants to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond anything we ask or think. He wants personal interaction with us. Sounds crazy. The God of all creation wants inter to interact with me. Yes. And he's so powerful he can. But he will never do it unless we are willing. He wants to see us love him. He wants to see us seek him out. He wants personal relationships. We can lead us in ways that we could never even imagine. He wants you to know things you never knew before. But that doesn't come simply because you believe in Elohim, this big heavenly mighty being in the sky. No, it comes because you have prioritized knowing Yahweh, the personal living creator God of the universe, personal relationship. And the way we do this is found in Isaiah 43. Look here. I, even I, am Yahweh. And apart from me, there is no Savior. We have the prophets. We have the Old Testament writings. They reveal portion of Yahweh to us. But we long for more. And so what did he do? He came here in person. He clothed himself in flesh and blood. In the person of Jesus Christ, the Savior. I, even I, am Yahweh. And apart from me, there is no Savior. In John chapter 8, Jesus is talking to religious leaders of his day. He says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Abraham? And they're thinking, wait a minute. Abraham existed 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago. And you're saying that he rejoiced. Hey, you're not even 50 years old yet. And Jesus responded by saying this. Next slide. Before Abraham existed, I am. Remember at the burning bush? Eh, yeah. I am. The great I am. What is Jesus saying here? Before Abraham, 2,000 years ago, I am Yahweh. They instantly picked up rocks. There's nothing in the text. It just says they went, they picked up rocks, and they started to, they were about ready to stone him. Why? Because they knew exactly what Jesus was saying. He was saying he's God, that he's Yahweh in the flesh. This isn't the only place he does it. 
Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 says this, For in him Jesus dwells all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 1.15, he, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Go to John chapter 1. It talks about how God became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word who was in the beginning, who was God, he became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is that fleshly person? It's Jesus. And we beheld him as the only begotten of the Father. If you want to get to know Yahweh, he has given us special ways. That is through the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus came so that we could know personally God. Get to know Jesus. You want to get to know God? You want it to be up close and personal? Get to know Jesus. Get into his word. Talk to him on a regular basis. Dive in. Go deep. Listen. Read from others. Talk about it with others. Go to a Sunday school class. Take every opportunity opportunity you can. I remember when I started going to church at 19 years old as an adult, I was at every single church. The one I missed was Sunday school because that was kid stuff. That's in my opinion because that's all my life. It was kids who went to Sunday school. So I didn't go to Sunday school. I went to Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night because I wanted to know God. I wanted to dive in. I wanted to get into the meat of his word. And so get involved in classes, get involved in groups. Goodness, start your own group. And say, just start learning. Make him, make knowing him the priority of your life, the pursuit of your life. There was a lady that, uh, back at the last church I was at, First Baptist Franklin, I was there, it was my first church. Um, she started coming to Wednesday night Bible studies, just Wednesday night at first. I'll call her Mary, because I don't want to give her last name, this is online. And she started to come to church, and I remembered watching her, and I was excited. You're always excited to have an extra person there. And she would come, and she'd, we'd be teaching the Bible, and she'd fall asleep, Mommy. And uh, I didn't say anything. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, she started getting more involved. She started coming to church on Sunday morning, and she started, she started getting connected in other places of the church. She started leading a ministry, a, a, a clothing ministry for poor, and helping with the food pantry at another church. And it was just incredible to see her starting. And man, she, was just, she says, I got rid of my cable. I'm just, I'm just listening to podcasts all the time now about God. I want to learn and grow. And one day, she's leaving the church the lobby there, and I looked at her, and I said, Mary, you really love Jesus don't you? And she looked at me in tears. I watched tears well up in her eyes. And she says, oh, Vernon, he's changed everything. I love him so much. And that just blessed my heart. Seeing this woman who was falling asleep in Bible study to just so involved and just consumed with knowing Jesus to the point she gets rid of cable so she can just dive in. It was wonderful and beautiful, and God has used her in so many people's lives. See, you can believe in Elohim, that great mighty being in the heavens, or you can know Yahweh, know him personally, know him by name. Some of you, some of you, today's the first day you knew God had a name. He wants so much more for you. Remember Psalm 910, we started with it. Those who know your name, trust in you. The more you get to know about him, the more you see he's worth all of your trust. Don't just be introduced. Don't just be happy with a religious association so that, oh yeah, I'm going to be in heaven when I die. Don't just believe in him. Know him. Know him. And that's what we're going to do over the next while. I hope you'll join us. I hope you'll be here every week and begin to know him more and more and make knowing him a priority, whether it's online or right here in person. And we're kind of hard finding reasons not to be here in person anymore. 15 new cases of COVID a day for the entire state of Illinois? I don't think COVID's an excuse anymore. We can be at church together. Let it illuminate your mind. Let it change you because it will. Let's bow together. As we bow, Jesus was praying in John 17, verse 3, and he said, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. To know Jesus, you have to come on his terms. And he says, repent. Turn from your selfish life, your sins, to him. Repent, believe, believe, trust in him, who he is, what he's done. 
repent, and believe. Sin only confuses and distracts us. He wants us clean. And you can be made clean by going to him. Seek his forgiveness. He'll give it to you. He has secured it at the cross for you. Have you been properly introduced to him? If you haven't been, pray with me right now. Say, Lord God, you are my creator. You made me to know me. Sin has kept me from you. I turn from my sin to you now. I trust in you. I don't have it all figured out, but the best I can, I trust in you. I accept what you did for me at the cross, your resurrection, so I can be forgiven, so I can be cleansed. I want to know you. Be my Savior and my Lord today in Jesus' name. And I want to continue to pray for all of us. Lord, help all of us not to be satisfied with just an introduction to you. Help us to long for a relationship where you are the center, the center of our lives, where you are the way and the truth and the life. Help us to grow deeply in a personal relationship where you and your ways are the focus of our lives. Because only in you will we ever truly be fulfilled, be satisfied, and be the person we long to be. In Jesus' name, amen.